Excellent. So, well, a very warm hello, good colleagues from across the world. Welcome to this webinar on mosquito-borne arboviruses, the rising global threat. And thank you for finding time to participate in a genuinely interesting and for me, even an exciting uh, lineup of, of presentations, kindly delivered by several top people uh, in their fields. Just so you're aware, we've had more than 443 people registering to attend this webinar, uh, and it represents about uh, 76 countries from across the world, and certainly demonstrates strong interest in the topic and the line of talks. So uh, uh, great having such a strong interest uh, being displayed. I've been told not to forget to introduce myself. So my name is Leo, Leo Brach. I have the privilege of working for Malaria Consortium as the Senior Vector Control Specialist for the Asia region and working behind the scenes to make sure this webinar has no technical glitches are my good colleagues, Dr. Tin Cho Thu and several people from our head office in London. My sincere thanks uh, to, to all those good people. Also just to mention that Malaria Consortium is a nonprofit international NGO with headquarters in London, but extensive operations in Africa and Asia. Uh, unlike what the name uh, Malaria Consortium may imply, we work not only on malaria, but also on a range of other public health issues and increasingly also on dengue therefore our interest in, in hosting this particular uh, webinar. A bit of background uh, to this particular webinar. Mosquito-borne arboviruses are making uh, a relentless advance across our planet, seeping across more landscapes and quietly infecting millions more people uh, as it advances. Part of the problem is that most of these cases are asymptomatic, as you know. So by the time they rear up and manifest as outbreaks, they've already made significant advances. So we are poorly prepared for the next outbreak. Our surveillance procedures are inadequate. Our vaccines are unacceptable, except for yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis. Our medicines really only for some symptomatic relief. And our vector control efforts in most cases not based on good science. So much of this lack of urgency and preparedness is because of the overriding fog of malaria and now also of course COVID-19 that hijacks the budget and manpower of health agencies. But uh, you know I think make no mistake arboviruses will take over from malaria in the long run as we uh, manage to bring malaria further and further down. Just like Zika emerged from the forests of Africa and hopped across the, the planet, there are multiple more such viruses quietly waiting in Africa and elsewhere to exploit man-made opportunities for dispersal. Uh, and this is why we have this particular webinar to find out more about the level of threat, where our response shortfalls uh, lie, and we have many shortfalls, uh, which I've mentioned, and how we should be preparing ourselves. Uh, uh, I need to spend a just a few seconds on how this webinar will unfold, uh, and I'll try to be brief. We have five PowerPoint presentations uh, back to back, each about 10 minutes in length, although our keynote presentation rightfully will go a bit beyond uh, 10 minutes in length. And uh, I think you will appreciate the extra length. It's going to be very interesting. This will be followed by a, a question and answer session. And then we have a, a medical specialist to review and sum up the webinar. Because of bandwidth and process issues, uh, everyone will be muted and video off, except for our panelists. But our audience members can submit written questions during the presentations. There's a Q&A box at the bottom there. Please precede your question with the name of the panelist you would like to respond to your question. If you have a particular person in mind, for example, Dr. Rahman preceded with that. Uh, how do I solve the world's arbovirus problems? So, you know, try and precede your question with a name. Uh, of the person you think is most appropriate to address your question. 
Uh, importantly, please, and I ask your help here, we really need your help to, to take this issue of arbovirus preparedness forward. There's a short poll at the end of the Q&A session. It shouldn't take more than about two minutes of your time to respond, and, and it'll help us greatly in uh, planning and moving forward with this whole arbovirus uh, uh, agenda and how to address the needs. Please respond to that poll if you don't mind. We may also lean on you in the next two weeks to fill in a little longer uh, survey sent by email, again to ask your opinions about the needs and shortfalls of arbovirus control. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the Malaria Consortium website within 48 hours. If you want to refer friends to, to watch it, if you enjoyed it and you'd like others to, to share it as well. So let's move on to the presentations. Uh, Dr. Tin, would you mind placing our esteemed speakers uh, on screen, please? We have with us today five top rated people to update us on arboviruses. First up is our keynote speaker, Dr. Raman Vilayudan, uh, which is followed then by Dr. Bupenda Nath Nagpal, then uh, Dr. Joel Lutomir, then Dr. Haraldo Becerra, and finally, uh, Mr. Ayman Ahmed. To these speakers and also our respected end of session reviewer, Dr. Prudence Hamade, uh, please accept gratitude from all of us. Uh, we truly appreciate Genuinely appreciate your time. Thank you for that. You spent a lot of time preparing these presentations uh, and we, we, we're grateful for that. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Raman Vlayudan, who is the Head Veterinary Public Health Vector Control and Environment Unit uh, of the Department of Control of Neglected Tropical Diseases at uh, WHO in Geneva, Switzerland. Dr. Vlayudan will uh, give the keynote introductory presentation, which is entitled Mosquito-Borne Arboviruses, A Global Perspective. So I have the pleasure to hand over to you, Dr. Rahman, and thank you. Uh, if you can thank pull you it up Thank you so once. much. I'm just uh, uploading my slide. Um, so. Thank you very much, uh, Leo. And uh, first of all, I must thank uh, Malaria Consortium and the Raft Project for taking up this initiative. This is really very timely and uh, extremely valuable for us as well, because we are uh, really struggling to bring this topic into the forefront at the global level. Next, uh, so basically my outline is going to be uh, just a touching on the global situation, the challenges of burden estimation, we will touch on the basics of uh, vector bionomics. What are the global management uh, issues at heart? How is the situation with, between uh, dengue and COVID at the moment? And what are the challenges and opportunities today we face? So the globally, as you can see, this uh, arboviruses affect around 130 countries. And this map uh, clearly shows the hotspots and the areas where arboviruses are more prone to occur. And uh, we have been tracking them all over uh, the regions of WHO and the burden is uh, steadily increasing. So just to take an example of dengue. For, so here is dengue, one of the worst arbovirus to affect a human population. And if you see the around 110 countries report dengue annually to WHO. And this figure, this uh, slide is basically shows the exact number of cases reported by countries. And uh, interestingly, you will see that in 2019, we have had the worst uh, uh, outbreak of dengue, uh, which was, which crossed 5 million reported cases. And in spite of COVID, 2020 was also quite a bad year and we are still collecting data and it is incomplete. That's why I have shaded it differently. One of the challenges of arbovirus is the burden. How are we going to sell this to our, our leaders and managers? Because more than 80% of the infection are asymptomatic and very often not captured by the health system. So WHO has developed a tool on dengue burden estimation, which can be done uh, with available data at a country level from time to time. So 
This helps you to capture the situation at a country level or a provincial level to highlight to our political leaders and decision makers what dengue is all about. So just to give you an example, on the right hand side, you see the number of reported cases by a country was 10,162. There were 24 deaths, uh, of which there are more than 7,900 were severe dengue. And actually the burden is much more at a community level, it's over a million. And uh, in terms of asymptomatic, which we were able to uh, estimate, it was over half a million cases. So we are not able to express the true burden of the disease to our decision makers, and we need to do this. And this is one of the whole area where we are putting our, a lot of effort and we are partnering agencies who are helping in burden estimations. And this will help us to get better resource allocation, plan and implement preventive measures, understand the epidemiology and spread of the disease, and also to come up with economic burden estimates. Now, this is an interesting scenario, just to show you where we are vis-a-vis -vis with malaria. Malaria is a very well-funded program in many countries. And as you can see today, the population at risk is much higher for dengue. The number of endemic countries are increasing. Today, we have 129 countries affected by dengue, uh, Afghanistan being the newest member. Infection rates are more or less the same. We have 100 to 400 million compared to the malaria figures. And the only problem is the lack of fear factor, which is the number of deaths. Deaths in malaria is far higher than dengue. And this is an issue which um, actually in the recent years, the estimates are showing that dengue deaths are increasing. So we are, the current estimate is between 40 to 70,000 deaths. Lancet in one of its recent publications has clearly highlighted that dengue is the only communicable disease to increase more than sixfold in the last, uh, since 2000. And you can see this graph. So this is a huge increase and dengue has increased uh, um, in the last uh, 10 years. It has been significant jump and uh, we, are, we are continuing to experience big outbreaks in many countries. So we really have a challenge here. Moving on to chikungunya, the other one which started, triggered off in 2004, 2005. For example, right now, in, uh, this, this year as well as in 2020, we had over nearly 200,000 cases and most of it were coming from Brazil. So these are the chikungunya affected countries. Right now we are dealing with some chikungunya outbreak in parts of Cambodia and uh, a few other countries uh, where we are still grappling with it, uh, basically from the 2020 outbreak. Zika, though many of people have now forgotten about it, frankly, the outbreak is still happening. We still have cases recorded. And in 2020, there were nearly 20,000 cases, mostly from the American region. Uh, but there were a few cases in the Asian region as well. So Zika is also alive and keeping on uh, affecting more people. Yellow fever. This, I really wanted to touch this because it is in the news. And we, have, we know very well there were outbreaks of yellow fever and a mass vaccination campaign is going on. And one area where people in the yellow fever group are interested is to strengthen the surveillance. So we have parts of Africa, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso affected by yellow fever last year. And actually even in Nigeria, we also had uh, outbreaks since 2017 and there is still some signs of uh, outbreaks currently in Nigeria. So there is a huge campaign going on, almost targeting 46 million people in Nigeria to get them vaccinated uh, for yellow fever. And this is being uh, very successfully being rolled out. And there's still uh, the fear that this uh, yellow fever outbreak can still spread to newer areas. And this is, uh, uh, I'm sure there will be presentation today on the situation in, in the American continent as well, where uh, in last week we have seen that in Brazil, they are suspecting a potential for yellow fever outbreak since they have record, reported deaths of monkeys um, in, in a yellow fever uh, belt. Moving on, on the vector bionomics, why I wanted to highlight this is very often we do not convey this very well. We are not tapping onto the weaknesses and uh, the challenges posed by the vector to us. Here are two vectors, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, which has silently spread across the world. And uh, as I said, about 150 countries all over the world are affected by these two mosquitoes. They have adapted very well. They are you're choosing newer breeding habitats. And as you can see, uh, Egypti is originated in Africa and has spread 
all over the tropics. Uh, Albopictus is more Asiatic, but has spread in all the continents right now, including Europe and the parts of USA. The challenge here is, well, the points we need to convey here is that uh, we are talking about an urban breeder who breeds in and around human habitations. The eggs are laid uh, single and uh, uh, full batch may be laid in several breeding sites and viable and they can remain dry for months. We need to tackle key per permanent breeding sites to have any impact. They bite during the day, which means we have to do control measures both at the place of residence and place of work. All of them are intermittent feeders in a sense they do not feed on one person alone. It likes to feed on many people in one round. So that leads to clustering of curses. And to add to the misery, there is also trans ovarial transmission of this virus, which is about 2%. And this has been confirmed in many places. Albopict is another unique one. It breeds in urban and semi-urban areas. It breeds in rubber plantations. Again, the dried eggs of Albopictus in used tires and lucky bamboo has helped its spread. It can, of course, be feed on animals. And it is considered a secondary vector. And uh, there are outbreaks listed here in China, Solomon's, Japan, where Albopictus was a primary vector. And it also transmits a dog heartworm. The main breeding grounds, all of you know about it. But the challenges are some of these uh, overhead tanks in Asia are becoming permanent breeding grounds. And we really need to address this by modifying the tank in such a way to prevent mosquito entry. And we are trying to uh, work with the industry to see whether we can do that. The other is, of course, as I said, lucky bamboo, axles of leaf, and unused uh, tires. We have, at the global level, WHO and member states have adopted the global vector control response in 2017, soon after the Zika crisis. And this response is now being adopted in regions across WHO. And we are beginning to see more and more uh, planned activities at country level. This response need, calls for a, a strong, it has four pillars. It, basically the first one is inter and intersectoral collaboration, mobilizing the communities, the second one, enhancing vector surveillance, monitoring and evaluation, and to scale up the tools. Of course, the foundation is we need to build capacities and we need to sustain our research. The enabling factors, of course, we need a good country leadership, advocacy, resource mobilization, partner coordination, regulation and policy and normative uh, support. So this global vector control response has very clear objectives. One is to reduce mortality and the other is to reduce the cases. And both these are, these are well aligned with the global uh, strategy for malaria as well as the global strategy for dengue. And we hope we can achieve these as years go by. Though at the present scenario, some of these may be a little difficult, but certainly it is achievable. And uh, in many cases, experts are saying that we can bring down dengue deaths to very negligible level if we are able to manage it properly. The last objective is to prevent epidemics from vector-borne disease, which is aligned with the sustainable development goal, where we are uh, tasked to prevent uh, epidemics of communicable disease by 2030. So vector-borne disease is, is, is well aligned with that. Talking about COVID, uh, COVID has really affected our work in a huge way. A large number of staff from uh, Dengue program have been called for COVID duties. And so here we are trying to mobilize more community support, getting the help of community health workers. We are introducing simple information, uh, education and communication materials through the media for both diseases. We are encouraging households who are under lockdown to really uh, spend some time together, go around and clean all the breeding sites and devote special sessions to raise awareness about COVID and dengue in schools and colleges. And of course, we have to practice all the precautions for COVID at the same time. The challenges we have really is, these are things which you will not see in textbooks or published papers, but one biggest challenge is the lack of field entomologists and vector control staff, which also linked to carrier pathway, which is very weak. It doesn't attract people and there is a role for senior staff here in government ministries to ensure that this career pathway can be created and vacancies are filled in time. There is a need for a new job description because our skill sets have changed. We need to talk to communities. We need to uh, communicate more better with the, um, educate more better with our policymakers and so on. 
At the programmatic level, we have to be very clear that dengue is not a strictly a health problem. It is a multi-sectoral problem, especially when we are dealing at uh, the local level in urban settings. And here we need a clear uh, funding, a sustained funding, uh, where we have to ensure that every partner has funds available. Then we have to make sure that all stakeholders have assigned staff and there's a backup. We must remember that yellow fever threat is there looming in Asia and there is a the recent paper which, uh, which clearly shows that the vectors of Asia, the Aegis vectors can transmit yellow fever under laboratory conditions. So we really need to be on guard with this. And at the same time, as I said in the beginning, vectors are changing their adaptation. They are silently spreading to rural areas. They are spreading to new breeding sites. And we also have two new viruses here, Mayuro virus and Orukuchu virus, which had caused outbreaks in recent years. And these are also additional uh, arboviruses coming through. This point is something new, which to many of you, what is water stress? Water stress is a phenomenon which will affect all of us in the coming years due to climate change, where many urban pockets, in the, especially in the red area, will run short of water. And I know in South Africa, it has happened. It has happened in India. And this photograph is from a city in India where we have seen liters of water being brought by train every day. And this is, uh, you can imagine a whole city population of 11 million running short of water. And water stress is going to be a reality. We have to take mitigation measures. And when water stress comes, people are definitely going to hoard water. And as you store more water, you are providing more breeding grounds for Aedes mosquitoes. So we really need to be on guard with this new challenge. The other one is, of course, the devolved health system is an opportunity as well as a challenge. In many countries, vector control is with the city council. Now, have we really managed the city council by providing them enough capacity to deal with it? There is also the challenge of provincial and national administration, how their work is sorted out and whether we can work, make them work together to deal with the dengue outbreak in an area. We need to coordinate partners. And here I need to emphasize that partners must have their own resources. And when they come around for the task force meeting so that clear earmarked resources can really be mobilized when there is an outbreak of dengue and sustain it over a period of time. There is definitely potential to tap the youth. There are countries where scouts and guides are being used for dengue control. We also need to target such groups like women group or church leaders or um, leaders from the, uh, from the faith organizations who can be targeted to convey the key message. Of course, we, have, we also need to make sure that the same message is conveyed through the media. The Columbia approach is one of them. Uh, sustaining the community motivation is definitely a key factor which we are beginning to address. How are we going to do that? The EPI program has done that quite well over the years. Can we take some key messages from them? How we do we motivate the community? And even the COVID provides us an opportunity for that. So this is just to conclude, basically, we have a great opportunity here to do work together, especially across uh, vector-borne diseases, enhancing surveillance. We need to track the movement of vectors and infection because as I said, they have spread to new areas. We have no clue unless we do proper surveillance. Climate change has its impact. There is uh, insecticide resistance across vectors which can be managed together. There needs to be, uh, surveillance has a role in elimination of diseases. So we need to tap on that as well. I have already said about utilizing the media for communication. We have to clearly assign tasks for partner agencies, which is our strength. Uh, the movement of viruses can be tracked and there are initiatives of cross-border uh, collaboration like um, United Dengue, which is done in ASEAN countries. And then of course, COVID gives us an opportunity to enhance diagnosis and disease management. We are also quite excited to see many new innovative tools coming through. Bulbakia, um, spatial repellent, new traps. So all these are, and of course we have vaccines in the pipeline as well. So it is a, it's a good opportune time where we have to focus our effort, go more programmatic and make sure that arboviruses are addressed in every country. Thank you very much. And I just want to share with you that recently the NTD uh, the Department of Neglected Tropical Disease have just launched a new roadmap uh, for the next 10 years. And here the global vector control response is, is, is one of the cross-cutting activity. And we encourage you to please read this and 
work with us. Thank you. My apologies, I was on mute uh, there, so. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, Rahman, uh, very sincere thank you for that uh, wonderful um, foundation, global overview, excellently, very professionally done. Uh, it sets the scene, uh, wonderful insights there. And what I was particularly grateful uh, for as well is, um, you know, pointing out the shortfalls and the needs uh, that, that need to be addressed and some reassuring messages as well. So uh, thank you for that. We are going to move on now to our next presentation, which is by Dr. Bupender Nath Nagpal. Uh, Bupendra, Bupender is a technical officer for the WHO Southeast Asia region and he's based in New Delhi and in India. So over to you, please, uh, Bupender. <clears throat> thank you, sir. <clears throat> First of all, I want to give my sincere thank to the Malaria Consortium, especially Dr. Leo Bat, who has given this opportunity to discuss here the herbovirus burden in Asia region. But here I am taking only the South Asia region, the country which are under the WHO, these are the 11 countries, and what is the position of dengue, chikungunya here, and uh, how we are controlling here that I am going to discuss in my talk. So as you know, this, uh, as Dr. Raman has already mentioned very clearly that these three major diseases, chikungunya, Zika, and dengue, they are spread by two mosquitoes, that is the Albopictus and the Aegypti. So they are, in the 11 countries, we are getting this, this mosquito, but uh, we are not getting the cases from the North Korea, except DPR Korea, otherwise from all the 10 countries we are getting the dengue and from seven countries we are getting the chikungunya and from the four countries we are getting the Zika. And if you see the burden, 1.3 million people live in dengue endemic areas in current countries of Southeast Asia region, except DPR Korea, Republic of Korea. Then the reason contribute to more than half of the global burden of dengue with all four serotypes as have rendered this country hyperendemic. There has been an increase in the both scale of frequency of the dengue outbreaks in the region during the past decades. The recent outbreak was in Sri Lanka in 2017, 2019 the outbreak was in the Bangladesh and Nepal. And five countries that India, Indonesia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka and Thailand of the region are among the 30 most highly endemic country in the world. Though in improvement has been made in the case management and reduction of CFR to below 0.5%. Now you see the con this total burden. If you see from 2011 and to 2019, as Dr. Raman said in the world, there are six, six uh, times six fold increase, but in Southeast Asia, it was about three fold increase. And in 2011, there were 0.1, yeah, you can say 0.2 million cases, one year, 0.2 million cases were there. And in 2019, it was near about 0 0.6 million, 0 0.7 million, you can say, cases are there. And this much of increase of cases are occurring throughout the, every year the number of cases are increasing. But if you see the CFR, it is reducing, it was 0.54, and it is now only 0.25. This indicates that the, our management part, case management part is working very nicely while the vector control, we are not getting so much of success and therefore the reason is reporting more number of cases. And you see, these are the, out of these 10 countries, in, from 2015 to 17, about every dengue cases are distributed among the three countries that Thailand, Indonesia and India they contribute more than the 80% of cases. And in 2018 and 19, then Sri Lanka and Bangladesh also added in that. So like that, the five countries, they are contributing maximum number of cases in the Southeast Asia region. 
And the same thing, if you see the deaths, more than 50% of the deaths due to dengue observed from Indonesia, followed by India, Thailand, and Myanmar. And in 2019, that was also observed from Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. I, I said you, there's a outbreak was there. And if we come to the country-wise, this is from 2011 to 2019, nine years data. If you see in Bangladesh, the minimum number of cases was recorded in 2014. That was only 375 cases. But 2019, when the outbreak was there, it was 1.01 million cases. And that's in 2014, it was zero. Now it recorded 166 during the outbreak. And CFR, you will see zero, it was point now four four. Like that in Bhutan, the minimum cases were recorded in 2014 and maximum recorded in 2019. And the CFR, if you see, it was zero and now it is 1.12. India and Indonesia, if you see, in, in, in India in 2011, 0.2 million cases were recorded, but now 1.6 million cases recorded in 2019. And that's due to dengue, it was 137 in 2014. And now it is 215 in 2070. Every year, India recorded the deaths from 100 to 200 like that, basically. And CFR, it was 0.11 and now 0.9. So in Indonesia, if you see, it was 0 0.4 million cases were there. And now 2 million cases have been record, recorded from Indonesia. and. Uh, <clears throat> not 2 million, 0.2 million basically. And then that's also 305, now it is 1593. So like that in Maldives also, the number of our cases minimum was recorded in 681 in 2013, and now it is 5,000 recorded in 2019. And in, in Myanmar, if you see, it was 0 0.5 million, now it is 0.44 million cases. So everywhere, if you see, in some year, the cases are low and next year, 2017, 18, after 2015, everywhere the number of cases has been increased. And this is the same thing with the Nepal and Sri Lanka. Nepal, you see, the minimum cases were recorded in 2011. That was only 79 cases. And now 15.7 thousand cases, 15 thousand cases have been recorded in 2019. There was also outbreak in 2019 there. And in Sri Lanka, this was only 0.28 million cases were there in 2011 and 1.86, 0.16 have been recorded in the 2017. Island and Timor Lisley, same conditions. So I will not go in detail in this. And now if you see the chikungunya, seven countries, they are recording the number of cases. And if you see the maximum number of cases has been recorded from India every year, it is started in 2015, you see 3,000, then 26,000, then 12,000, then 9,000, then 12,000. Every year, the number of cases has recorded. Myanmar, recently, in 2019, they recorded the three, num three number, only three cases. Indonesia also, every year they record. Nepal also started reporting only two, four, five, six, one cases in Nepal. And Thailand also recording every year. So every earlier, very few countries, as Dr. Raman told, in the only 130 countries affected with the dengue, and the number of the countries also increasing in case of the chikungunya also, and in the Southeast Asia region also, in before the 2015, only three countries were affected. Now it is more than seven, now it is seven countries which are affected with the chikungunya also. And these are the factors very also discussed very clearly by Dr. Raman also, but you see. The major fact, the major challenges are that as we know, there is no medicine for the Jika, not, not for any dengue, not for the our chikungunya. And more than 60% asymptomatic infections are there. This is one of the biggest challenge. Then unplanned urbanization, it's growing like anything. Then poor sanitation. Although the sanitation poor drainage, they never support the breeding of the Aedes mosquito. But whatever the solid weight accumulate on that, they support the breeding of the Aedes mosquito during the rainy season. Then high population density. You see how much the population density increasing, then the number of uh, the population density is increasing. 
number of houses are increasing when the number of houses are increasing the number of the storage capacity is in containers are increasing and then the number of population of the aedes mosquito is also increasing then and the construction people are constructing their house and everywhere construction is going on there are some illegal some are illegal so like that the construction are going on then the migration the migration take place for the both virus also and for the mosquito also they are migrating to the airplane also they are migrating to the bus also they are migrating to the train and ship and like that because <clears throat> when and for that reason the number of countries are increasing because the mosquito they are flying from one country to another country by this mode of transport and the virus is also going from one place to another place and the another major problem which we have challenge is that the generally we don't allow any cattle in the urban areas so mosquito in general they are zoophagic but when the cattle are not there they have to bite on the human being so there is no other choice so this is the reason one of the reason that the man mosquito contact is also increasing and therefore the number of guinea pig cases also increasing then shortage of water as dr ravan also said very clearly the um, they, they say they that uh, transporting the water to the train but if you see timing of the water whether it is coming only for one hour or two hour in the urban areas in the rural area also by power supply is there and they are getting only one hour or two hour for that reason they are making a container they are storing the storing the water and this is the major reason why we are getting the number of cases increasing the urban area also and also we are getting the number of cases in the rural area also and very clearly this global warming they are also because the temperature and humidity they affect the life of the mosquito also and the incubation period of the virus in the mosquito so these are very important global warming is taking place then cryptic breeding site dr raman has very clearly said there are lot of breeding site 100 and 100 breeding site only 5 ml of water is required to breed this mosquitoes so this is very important so very small water they love to breed there and their population increases so very difficult to identify the breeding sites during that rainy season but in the non transmission season they have a limited breeding sites and we can control there for that reason we have to this is a biggest challenge ki we have we do the work only the vector control during the rainy season or the transmission period so we have to increase our vector control during the non transmission season then it biology as dr ramana also again was very clearly said its breeding habit its feeding habit its biting habit it's very very challenging because if you see biting habit they bite during the day time feeding habit the problem is that when they bite during the day time they bite more than one to more than 1% sometimes 4% there is a record that they can bite up to 17% in a single bite so this type of challenges are there and for that reason we are not able to get the more effective control because of these challenges and the disease is increasing and we are you see these other captive breeding sites i don't want to go in detail in this and now this is a dr raman has shown very clearly the control but this is a to keep going to incidence low keep mosquito population low this is main objective break and break the transmission so for this four lines are there surveillance sustainable breakback preventive control outbreak management and community outreach so these are the important thing and we need also the research and enforcement of the public education this is very important for dengue control and these are the options which are available at the present time and these are the indoor residual spray we generally do targeted spray when we know this is the places where the aedes mosquito are resting but generally they won't directly rest on the wall but they are resting on the table under the chair and the sofa so we have to target that sites after identification where they are resting so we have to do iris in that site also then you see environmental management that is a manipulation and modification we have to do biological control then repellents there are a lot of repellents are there are coming repellents they don't decrease the population of the mosquito but they 
but they reduce the man mosquito contact so this is the thing then the traps are there biological control are there chemical control is there modify better this modified genetic modified mosquitoes are there then your valvakia is there dr raman already told so these are the method we have to select and then do the control accordingly and these are resolution i will not go into detail the time is going to the resolution you see 7 september it was held and these are the urges were made to the states and that this is the who support i will go for the who support building joint effect for the planning and the implementation evidence based studies that has been being given by the who to support in providing information on the best practice for the elimination of malaria and dengue and to support indoor adopting evidence based integrated vector strategies and to support in creating data sharing platform to relevant to case and vectors and these are the technical challenges shortfall that the lack of staff in the country already discussed dr bhai raman coordinating between the agencies within the country that intersectoral coordination then sitting council assigned vector control where they have don't have the technical support then intersectoral coordination is limited then shortage of hospital beds and the transport of the patient is a big challenge so these are the few important challenges technical then the research abbey is not addressed as top national priority for the research then the institutions are not filling vacant position and un well <coughs> unable to attract field entomologists this is very important most of the positions are lying vacant then the funding gaps find so uh, dr raman has been clearly discussed that we are not getting the funding then the lack of respect to the guide student there is no professor teacher who are give the guidance to the student to do the work on the dengue basically medical entomologists are not there then the lack of the community participation this is one of the very important thing in dengue it is very much required and this is my last slide that the threat of the dengue is very high in the cr as i already shown you then we have to focus on the prevention because generally we go for the control but prevention is much better than the control then community based intervention should be promoted vector control lacks due to many challenges especially in the vector biology so we are, we have already discussed dr raman also discussed on that vector biology plays a very important role then the com combined impact of the covid 19 and dengue epidemic could have devastating consequences on the population at risk so this is the because of covid the number of cases also increased with the most of the staff has been diverted towards the covid so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you so much uh dr bipendra thank you so much for that excellent overview of the southeast asia region and for highlight highlighting the particular challenges or the particular high level of threat that southeast asia experience especially certain specific countries loads of information there fascinating insights so for that we appreciate uh, your sharing this information with us uh, dr bipenda and also highlighting the 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 some of the shortfalls and challenges lack of entomologists lack of uh, uh uh entomological guidance community participation etc so uh we move on to an african perspective now uh some background from africa and i'd like to welcome dr joel lutomir uh, who is principal research scientist obovirus and viral hemorrhagic fevers laboratory at the kenya medical research institute kemri Uh, in Kenya so over to you uh, uh, dr joel uh thank you dr talio brak and may I take this opportunity to thank you and the malaria consortium for having given me the opportunity to present something on tabo viruses with regard to the african continent so may is... i interrupt may i interrupt yeah. and ask if you go full screen please oh yeah okay sorry thank you for that yeah sorry okay. about that excellent thank you yeah 
So I'll take this opportunity to thank you, Brack, and um, the Malaria Consortium for inviting me for this webinar to talk about the current status and trends of mosquito-borne arboviruses in Africa. My name is Ritomi Joel from Kenya Medical Research Institute, Arbovirus and Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Laboratory. I may want to start by saying that um, Africa bears the burden, the greatest burden of arboviruses. And probably it, um, all the arboviruses or most of the arboviruses occurring across the country have an origin in Africa. And if we we'll talk about arboviruses in Africa, it will take really a long, long time. But because of the time limitation, I think I'll just share a few slides and uh, focusing mainly on those that are of medical importance that have caused outbreaks on the continent. So globally, we have more than 300 mosquito species which are involved in the transmission of arboviruses, but we have uh, Aedes and Culex mosquitoes which transmit more than 200 viruses out of the over 500 viruses available. While active passive surveillance studies have revealed virus circulation during epidemics, most disease documentation has actually occurred during episodes. So we have this slide just giving us an overview of some of the arboviruses that, that have been isolated in Kenya and then within the rest of the Africa in general. So if you look at this, we find that okay, there are quite many, but still they're not all of them. But again, the most important thing is that uh, we need to continuously monitor the circulation of these viruses, as well as the evolution, uh, the evolution for early identification and ensuring that in the event of an emergence of these threats, we are able to put the necessary measures into place for the purpose of uh, controlling them. Now, in this case, I want to mention about an example of the Zika virus, which I think from the time it was isolated in Uganda many, many years ago, um, it went quiet and attended until it came up to cause really epidemics in various parts of the country. So it's really important that we keep tabs on the many viruses that we continue to isolate within the African continent for the purpose of ensuring that we are aware of their ability to um, maybe cause uh, epidemics in the future. Looking at an overview of the arboviruses uh, outbreaks within the East and Central Africa, we have part of the African continent uh, with dots indicating where we've had about the six arboviruses uh, having caused outbreaks. So in this case, we are talking about yellow fever. We have the Rift Valley fever. We have the Dengue 1, 2, and 3. We have Chikungunya. We have Semiliki Forest. And then we have Onyongnyong virus. So, hi, Brad. Sorry about that. No, no problem, Joel. Oh yes, we have a slide that is missing here. Um, just sh showing us an overview of uh, the dengue uh, outbreaks and um, distribution within the African continent. I don't know how that happened. Uh, probably I'll mention about the chikungunya and then the rest first of all. So if you look at the chikungunya, um, the history and distribution within the African continent, this a virus that is usually transmitted by Aedes aegypti and the Aedes albopictus within the Asian continent. We do not have Asian Aedes aegypti uh, albopictus within the African continent. But again, with, within the current uh, surveillance and outbreaks, we are starting to see a trend where Fearless fungicides are becoming vectors of this particular disease. So going forward, I think when it comes to looking at ways in which we need to control the vectors, then I think this one area where we feel that work, I think, is going to be a challenge. So this virus that was first detected in Tanzania way back in 1955 and currently spread out in roughly 30, 31 countries. During the 2004 05 outbreak, we had the largest outbreak occurring within the coastal Kenya. 
where we had more than 13,000 cases being reported. But this outbreak later on spread to the Indian Ocean Islands, including the Comoros, the Reunion, and also Mauritius. Within these uh, islands, I think the number or the percentage of the infected population was really very high. So in the red, we're having the African continent indicating uh, the belt within which we have the chikungunya outbreak occurring. So as you can see, we have almost uh, 30 something countries and I think there's that opportunity or chance that the chikungunya will have to spread beyond that particular belt in other countries. Um, we have yellow fever, the history and distribution originated within the Central African and later on subsequently spread to the East and West Africa. Currently, we have 34 countries at risk of epidemics, according to WHO 2018. In terms of the burden, it causes uh, severe uh, sickness within the continent to the tune of 84,000 to 170. Thousand cases, and then 29 up to 60,000 deaths within the continent. So in this case, we find that yellow fever is really a major public health important within the African tropics and should be looked at uh, very seriously and carefully uh, going forward. This map provides yellow fever endemic regions, which are green and red, and distribution of wife genotypes, which are explicit in yellow, red encounters, uh, 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 represent the countries with the reported wave outbreaks from 1984 to 2001. And this that is according to, according to WHO. And what I believe that between 2001 and right now, I think there's a big difference with regard to how this virus has spread within the African continent. And this is well illustrated within our next slide, which is showing the burden of YF in Africa. So according to some studies which conducted um, or reviewed information beginning from 1940 all the way up to 2010, both in Africa and also the rest of the world, you find that we have the greatest burden of yellow fever occurring within the African continent. If you look on the right, we have the figure also showing the information which was fed within the WHO from 1980 to uh, 2018. So if you look at the blue bus, that is confirmed cases within the African continent. And then we have the confirmed cases within the South, South, Southern Africa, which is red. So in this case, it really gives us a clear indication that uh, we have the African continent bearing the greatest burden of yellow fever. And therefore it requires a lot of focus with regard to the resources availability and ensuring that we have the virus being controlled. On the other side, hand again, we have the Rift Valley Fever virus, which was first uh, identified in Kenya way back in 1912, and currently is endemic in most of the sub Saharan Africa. So the epidemiology of this virus is such that within the African East African region, outbreaks are usually linked to prolonged and heavy rainfall. While in the West African region, we have the outbreaks usually occurring during normal or poor rainfall. However, give, looking at the recent uh, outbreaks within the Kenyan uh, country, we are starting to see a situation where outbreaks are also occurring with, uh, during a minimal rains or the short rain uh, seasons. Usually this mosquito has been isolated from many vector species across the globe. But within Africa, we have two major species, that is Aedes macintoshi and Aedes ochrysias, which are considered to be the primary vectors. While in the West African region, we have Aedes ochrysias, Aedes vexans, arabendis, and then Culex poecilipes, which are uh, the primary vectors of the disease. So if you look at this map of Africa, it's actually showing the special temporal distribution of RBF outbreaks from the time it was first detected in Kenya, way back in 20, uh, 1912, all the way up to um, the current state, that is uh, probably 2007, sorry, 2016. So within the 
West African region, we have the Mauritius, sorry, Mauritania and Senegal, where I think 1967 up to 1989 within the Senegal region, and then 1993, 94, and then 99. And in this case, we have 22 um, human deaths which are recorded during that particular time. Coming back to the East African region, we have the 1912 within the Kenya region, 1931, and then all the way up to uh, 207, 208. Now, cumulatively, for all those years, we find that Rift Valley fever has caused uh, 375 human deaths in Kenya alone. In Tanzania, all the way from 1947 up to 2007, we had 142 cases. South Africa has also experienced um, uh, Rift Valley outbreaks from 1950 all the way to 2011. Uh, but no death was reported within this particular country. And then the far um, southeast, Madagascar, also some cases together with 14, 17 human deaths having been reported. Um, moving forward, we have the Onyongnyong, which is closely related to Chikungunya virus. We also have the West Nile virus, which have also been documented within parts of the country. Beginning with Onyongnyong, the first time that is was actually isolated was it between 1959 to 1960 in the Lake Victoria Basin. And during this outbreak, we had more than 2 million cases which were documented. So there was a lull between 1960 and 1996, where the second outbreak in Uganda occurred, causing sporadic cases occurred, and we also had sporadic cases within the African countries. Vectors of Nyongnyong include Gambi and Falesters, which are distributed more or less across the globe. And you find that in many countries within the not global, but many countries within the African continent. And you find that, okay, probably the risk of this um, virus spreading out are very high, even in areas where it has not been reported at all. However, within the recent zero survey in Kenya by Labuid 2015, it has been demonstrated that Onyongnyong circulation is circulating within the coastal region of Kenya. And this is together with Chikungunya virus. So the true burden of this Onyongnyong virus within the African continent and also Kenya in particular may not necessarily be understood because we have not really gone out to do a lot of research with regard to um, Onyongnyong virus. But I think given that they are closely related to Kungunya and they tend to circulate together. So probably they're also responsible with quite a, a number of the febrile uh, sicknesses or illnesses that are observed within the various parts of uh, the country and also the continent. So I may want to say that West Nile virus has not been a really a big problem within the African continent, but again, we see that it was first treated in Uganda way back in 1937. Principally transmitted by Culex pipians, Culex invitators, and the Merinae, and then Queen Quay facetas. So, this figure here is showing us the distribution of West Nile on the African continent, where we are seeing the green, which has been detected through serological survey, and then we have isolations which has occurred in the areas that are uh, painted or colored. Right, but still requires close monitoring. So we have quite a number of institutions within the African continent which are involved in doing research in human health. And most of these are usually the research institutions, mainly within the uh, uh, research institutions. We have the universities, we have international research uh, institutes again, and most of these research institutions tend to work in collaboration with each other. And what the table that we are seeing here is showing the number of, or the percentages of the people who are working within certain uh, research institutions, be the universities, national research centers, uh, the Ministry of Health and so on and so forth. So with regard to the capacity to conduct research within the African region, uh, there was a survey which was conducted by PAMCA way back in 2019 to determine how many endomologists, for example, we have on the continent. And out of those who 
provided the information, we can see that they're actually concentrated within the belt that we're seeing here. We have the yellow fever belt, we have the chikungunya belt, and uh, this is the same belt where we observe the dengue uh, occurring. So there's a very close correlation between institutions that conduct research and where these uh, vector-borne diseases are occurring, occurring. However, the problem is that uh, over 95% of the endomologies or research work is actually being conducted for malaria, and the remaining 5% is being conducted with arboviruses, which is currently becoming a major problem within the global, uh, within the African continent. So we see the endomologists with the PhDs only 215, MSc 253, 43, 173, with BSc, and so on and so forth. Total institutions being 89 across the African continent. So the extent and challenges of the control of virus vectors in Africa, we find that in most of Africa, vector control during epidemics is actually not being conducted. As much as this is important to ensure that, okay, the population of the vectors is kept low for the purpose of ensuring that uh, no outbreaks or transmissions occur. But this usually because of lack of funding. However, we find that uh, during um, outbreaks, we have an extent, to some extent, the chemical based control of arboviruses or arbovirus vectors being conducted just in reaction to the occurring outbreaks. This is usually less effective because of the level of vector resistance to chemicals used is unknown. And therefore, these chemicals are being used indiscriminately. So it's required that monitoring of the same is considered so that we come up with better ways of ensuring that we have effective uh, tools or chemicals to control the vectors. So the monitoring of changes in the mosquito population also is not conducted during outbreaks. And uh, limited technical capacity within the countries to conduct these activities, field activities, is also not there. And there's different species requiring specific approaches. So there's quite a lot of knowledge that is actually required within the African continent so that we can have the capacity being built to ensure that uh, we're able to conduct the vector control in an appropriate manner. There's also a lack of sustainability due to insufficient funding from within and also from outside. So going forward, I think it's a requirement that uh, probably we source for more funds, we build capacity within our continent so that we are able to conduct surveillance as required and also conduct vector control as may be necessary. So in regards to arboviral surveillance in Africa, again, we have challenges. One, there's lack of funding by governments for active surveillance, which is important to detect the transmission of arboviruses early enough and then put preventive measures in place for the purpose of ensuring that the outbreak does not really occur, or if it has occurred, then it has not spread to become really explosive. There's also limited differential diagnostic capabilities, which leads to misdiagnosis. And as a result, we find that the burden of arboviruses in Africa is actually under, overshadowed by the malaria, the typhoid, uh, and etc. So I believe that, okay, there's need for us to develop homegrown solutions to home, um, African problems. And in this case, there's requirement for us to invest heavily in the research to come up with local diagnostics that are capable of diagnosing the arboviruses that we have within the African continent. There's also inadequate expertise, technical capacity, due to lack of access to appropriate training and training materials, and then lack of proper succession planning by many governments in such a way that we have experienced um, scientists retiring before new ones are actually brought on board. And as we are, much, uh, as we are aware, we find that uh, most of this training is actually on the job as opposed to within institutions. So there's need for African governments to ensure that we have proper succession planning to, uh, so that we have every um, institution being well staffed with the people that it requires to conduct research. There's poor knowledge about viral disease by clinicians and the general public hampers 
thus hampering the identification and deporting of abovariuses within certain parts of the country and continent. And then lack of appropriate biocontainment facilities because certain pathogens require specific biocontainment facilities for them to be um, for, for the purpose of manipulation, e.g. Uh, RBF. And then insecurity and collapsed health systems in some countries lead to unreliable monitoring and therefore reporting systems on diseases. And in the long run, you may also find that there's always spillover from neighboring countries uh, with regard to the uh, above virus uh, transmission as a result of uh, cross-boundary movement of people. So thank you very much. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joel. Uh, could you stop sharing screen? There we go, excellent. Uh, some excellent <laughs> insights there. Um, we ran well beyond our allotted time, but okay, I'm going to ask our next two speakers uh, if they can try and try and really stick to the, uh, the suggested 10 minute limit uh, per presentation. Let's try and be uh, uh, better at that. But thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joel. Uh, you made some very, very good points there. Uh, it's interesting that Africa has been the home, the source of uh, many of our global arbovirus challenges currently, Zika, chikungunya, uh, yellow fever, uh, Usutu, well, West Nile virus, and, and several others, and still many uh, lurking in uh, in, in Africa waiting for perfect storm conditions to escape just like the Zikas of the world did uh, earlier on. A whole bunch of uh, arboviruses still uh, present in Africa and may well escape. So, and pointing out uh, issues like uh, lack of knowledge regarding insecticide resistance. These are issues that are, are global. Uh, there's a fascinating story about the spread in the 1600s of uh, yellow fever to the Caribbean and so on. Uh, but that's a, that's a whole book in itself, absolutely fascinating. And then the threat that yellow fever poses to Asia because Aedes albopictus, Aedes uh, aegypti uh, occur widespread and abundantly across Asia Fascinating question, why has yellow fever not jumped and established itself in Asia? And it'll be disastrous if and when, or in, uh, rather when it does uh, move over to Asia. So thank you, Dr. Lutomir. We now move for an America's uh, perspective and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Haroldo Becerra uh, if you could share some insights with us, please. Thank you, Dr. Becerra. Thank you, Dr. Leo, and thank you the Malaria Consortium for this opportunity to present an overview about the abovirus situation in the America. Uh, I will go to share my screen. Okay. And And I, I, I divide my presentation in three, three talks. The first is the background and the challenge that you have in the America. The second is the strategy that you're using for response and vector control. And then for the, in the last in the session, you're talking about some comments and reflections about the situation in the Americas. When, if I go to, to discuss about the arbovirus in the American, the first is this is a big problem for us. And uh, we found it in, in almost all countries that we have in, in the continent. But I needed to take in account that this is not the only problem that we have in, about vector-borne disease. We have another other problems, important problems in the region. And I give the example for in Brazil, we face and um, at, uh, up to 11 another important vector borne diseases. Why are you talking about it? I, I'm talking about it because when we have to make some approach, we need to have this approach 
could be responding for another vector-borne disease too, not only for uh, bovirus diseases that we, we found in some places in, in the region. The situation for us is very complex and you're having and some outbreaks in the region. If you look in this and chart, you see that in 2016, we have um, more than 3.5 million cases and they will have a, 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 a slow transmission during 2017, 2018, but the situation going increase again in 2019, 2020, we have an, a decrease. And in 2020, we have an, um, a, uh, around 2.2 million cases reported in the region. But this chart is important to, to show that the big problem for us in America is the transmission of dengue. And uh, we have a transmission of the, the other, another important uh, bovine disease like in chikungunya and Zika, but the, the, the main problem remained the transmission of dengue. But if you're going to look in, in more detail, you see two, two important um, Indicators, the, the first is the proportion of the severe dengue and the disease is increasing in the region. And the another was the fatality, uh, case fatality rates that has increased in during the 2000, 2010. After that, this is now in decreasing in our region. And uh, talking about um, the, the challenge in infect control, it's the same that in the, the colleagues that uh, speaking before me are explaining. We have an unplanned uh, situation for the cities and we have an, um, a stress of the supply of order and the problem for um, security and um, for providing um, an amount of the quality of order for our the population in the region. But Talking about the particular to vector control, we have three, three, three principles and challenges. The first is the, the, the actions is based in, on indirect in vector control. It does not incorporate in the new, new approaches or new elements like in the socioculture and the communication and the looking for how the environment may be changing to help the vector control. The second problem that we have here is that the control structures is based predominantly in the use of the pesticides. And sometimes it is not, the disease is not properly and the disease make a lot of pressions and the resistances in, in the IAD mosquito in our region. And the last is that they have a few and um, resources to mobilize in the region, and it is this res, um, resource in big part area around the vector control, and the, this is make it impossible to invest in another important uh, element, how the mobilization, communication, or or try to make and some much better the environment and the try to make it this uh, situation more more and um, more uh, keep giving us the opportunity to better control of aerial mosquito in the region well and um, about the policy that we have in the region in the last is three uh, ten years was working with the countries and the launching different end policies. I, I show you the, the last two that was launching. And the, this is very important for us because it is, is a, a commitment of the, the, the state members that go to implementing actions to, to face the problem of vector bar, uh, AIDS, uh, arbovirus diseases in the region. We have a strategy that was launched in 2016 and you have a plan of action for entomology and vector control that was launching in 2018. And uh, for facing this problem that I presented before, 
the region was working to try to adapt the integrated vector management as, as, as a tool to improve the vector control in the region. And the, for this, the, the countries are working with the PAHO and the recently we, we launched in this document in the handbook for integrated management in the America. This is adapted for the American. And the another important the document was the uh, about to environment issues and for addressing this problem and helping to vector control in the Americans. And uh, when we're talking about the, the vector control in, the, in our region, it's important to, to highlight that during the, the past and uh, 14 years, we are using the same uh, methodology for vector control. It's based on the um, visit, um, house to house visit. Recently, in a group of the, the countries and the experts in the region has developed an, an, a new proposal um, for new operational model for control of IADs. This was an um, edit, a document, and this is published now. And the important for this is that now that we try to changing the operational model in the Americans for um, a focus in the hotspot that you have transmission dengue in the city. This is, now we are working with the countries to try to, to, to adapt this and new model for the situations of the, each country. And the, we hope that in the few years we have been implementing this new approach in trying the Americans in the not only to try to make new and um, approaches or new methodology for control but we work with the countries to to update the different models of the control and here i presenting you the this and um, guideline that we edit in the last year when you present it to the country, uh, opportunity to use an IRS as a tool to help the, the control of ads and the, the operational activities that are made in the region. And for preparing our region for new technology, this is very important because when we're talking these in our region that we have a new tools, for example, and Mosquito and uh, genetic modified mosquitoes, mosquito infected with Bulbachia, new new traps, and we have a sort of new technology that is coming uh, to our region to be implemented for the the, the countries. And the this this we needed to prepare the countries to receive in this new technology. For this, we are working with the countries to 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 develop and edit this document that the evaluation for innovative strategy for IADS control. And uh, we, we're using this document in two, in two uh, different um, assessment that we made. One was in Brazil and another was in Colombia. And we produced some report and they send it to the countries and to develop this this uh, two assessment was about the project that Volbac there is in our region. One was in Medellin, and the another was in Rio de Janeiro. And we think that this, this with these um, procedures, uh, now the countries are much better uh, prepared to implement a, to implementing the new technology. For example, the use of Volbac for IADS control. Dr. Bo, uh, um, Becerra, I'm sorry to interrupt, just to remind you, 10 minutes have gone. Okay. Can we try and speed up a little bit? Sorry okay. about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The, the, another uh, activity that we are developing in the region is to try, try to establish an um, uh, um, entomological system, regional entomological system. is based in two network, one for, um, for um, monitoring resistance inside site or for and to, to track the infection of the virus in mosquito. And 
for face the problem with um, COVID-19 in the region, we developed two documents, one to, to guide you how to make the AIDS control during the pandemic, and another one for preventing dengue in the, in the region. And to finish my presentation, I would like to present it to some research and file that we think that's important to compare this new approach for vector control, incorporate chemical, biological, or environmental strategies, assess the make the assessment of the cost benefits of the, the new interventions for AIDS born and diseases in the hotspot. In the last thing proposal is to understand the dynamic of the, the impact of the new technology and vet control in the in the our region. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pereira. Uh, I, I apologize for interrupting you there. You were actually very close to the end anyway. So uh, uh, but thank you very much. There were some really great insights over there. I like the two, the, the, the final slides uh, pointing out where, what we should be thinking about and so on. Uh, very useful uh, uh, guidance there in, in a number of slides. Thank you for that. So um, we are now going to move on to uh, our final presentation. It will be from Mr. Ayman Ahmed. And Ayman is a lecturer at the Institute of Endemic Diseases, University of Khartoum in Sudan. Ayman, uh, over to you, but may I ask you to be conscious of the need to try and stick to 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Liu, and uh, thank you all for uh, the Military Consortium for setting up uh, this very interesting and edifying uh, webinar. I will take, uh, take your notes and uh, I will try to uh, go briefly uh, over my presentations uh, in respect for the times. Um, my presentation is uh, mainly uh, had two components. Uh, the first one should be a brief overview of the epidemiology of mosquito-borne arboviruses in, in Sudan. And the second component will be about highlighting the challenge and uh, for the surveillance and response with a few suggestions for if improvement. Hopefully that might, might be helpful. Uh, brief introduction about Sudan. It is the third largest country in, uh, in Africa and Arab League uh, with uh, nearly 2 million uh, kilometer, uh, square kilometers. Um, it used to be the largest uh, before uh, 2010, uh, when it gets set in two countries. And uh, the estimated population it is uh, nearly 50 uh, million individuals in 2020. The country has, uh, because of the large size of the country, it, ha um, it has uh, several international borders with seven countries, including Eritrea, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Central Republic of Africa, Chad, Libya, and Egypt, in addition to the open border and uh, on the coast of the Red Sea. Uh, this large size uh, uh, of the country uh, made it have a huge ecological and climatic variations with several um, uh, ecological zones, including uh, desert and, uh, and semi-desert uh, area, coastal and sub-coastal area, uh, rich and poor savanna and forest zones. Uh, however, uh, the country in general is characterized by uh, the short rainy seasons uh, between September and December. That when uh, the transmission season of, of uh, most of the vector borne disease occurs, and uh, particularly epidemics. Uh, most of the population relies uh, on farming and animals uh, breeding, uh, in addition um, to other um, uh, work in uh, categories. Uh, this um, uh, highlights uh, the high contact between human and animals and close contact with, with the national environments and uh, the, um, 
and the boundaries between urban and pre-urban and selvatic environments almost is not that clear or, or identifiable. Uh, to come in uh, uh, and have an, uh, a brief uh, uh, about the community of mosquito awareness in Sudan, Sudan suffers from high burden of wide spectrum of uh, arboviral uh, disease. And uh, this in turn, uh, this arboviral disease, in, uh, the main arboviral disease include uh, yellow fever, dengue, chungunia. And mosquito uh, arboviral disease are particularly uh, high uh, uh, in the country. And uh, each state of, of the country uh, is uh, endemic with at least two or more of, uh, of these mosquito borne arboviruses. And the major one, as I said, include dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya, rift valley fever, and West Nile virus. Uh, I will try to go briefly uh, over this major arboviral disease in, in mosquito borne arboviral disease in Sudan and, and the epidemiology highlighting the main point. So, for the yellow fever, it is the most prevalent disease, it's one of the most prevalent diseases in the country. And uh, it's spread over all the country. Uh, uh, state highlighted with with uh, yellows is where uh, yellow fever uh, have been reported. So at least um, it present in 15 out of 18 states in, in the country. Most of them in the central and western part of the country. About uh, seven. Uh, this leave about 70% uh, of the country population at risk of the disease. And therefore, after a uh, countrywide um, uh, viral risk assessment that have been implemented in 2012, uh, following the outbreak of yellow fever, uh, in collaboration with uh, WHO and Bastille Institute, a massive um, multi-stage vaccination campaign has been la launched in, in the country, starting with area with, with the highest risk, uh, where outbreak have been reported and is uh, also the burden of the better, uh, the main better LCG time and moving on toward the least at risk countries. And uh, regarding the dengue fever, it's, um, it's has been described for the first time in 1906 in the country. Uh, however, as a public health issue, it was uh, totally confined to the eastern part of the country where the four phenotypes of, the, uh, of dengue have been reported in several states in, in Sudan, including Gararif and Katala and Bursulan. And uh, this uh, confined issue has recently started to move on uh, with, with the different disease dynamic, and uh, the disease has been emerged uh, in Darfur in the west of the Sudan in 2014 for the first time uh, to be detected from there. However, more than um, about 70 uh, or about 80% of the country population at risk of dengue with, with the current distributions over most, uh, most of the country uh, state. Uh, for West Nile virus, um, unfortunately, it's uh, it is almost uh, neglected. It's uh, and only uh, accidentally detected uh, during an uh, outbreak of a viral illness. And um, after sorting out the major concern uh, parties, uh, dengue and yellow fevers. Uh, however, it's endemic in the country since uh, are reported as early as 1942. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's not uh, targeted by, by the surveillance and only accidentally uh, detected. As recent also emerged uh, similar to dengue, I, I, I believe that due to um, environmental and dynamic change, therefore, have uh, both uh, West Nile virus uh, and dengue have uh, emerged through, um, in that for on in the same times, uh, uh, almost uh, just one year in between. However, it's less distributed throughout the country, not like uh, dengue or, or yellow fever. Uh, uh, but most of uh, this uh, state has additional risk factors uh, that require uh, particular attention because like areas like 
uh, Sinar on the neighbor state, White Nile and uh, South Kordofan and some years in Darfur and Khartoum, also mainly US into the Northern state. But all this is, uh, uh, the majority of this state are characterized by having um, large lakes of water where uh, immigrant beds uh, coming from Europe during uh, the winter and spending uh, some uh, cold times uh, or days there before they go back or to Europe or to proceed in, into other African countries and then return uh, to fulfill their immigra animal migration uh, journey. This highlights that, it, uh, that uh, was my advice in, uh, in particular, it, it shouldn't be uh, considered as a country issue, but more as, as a global issue and all the control effort in the country need to be coordinated with other endemic countries uh, in the line of this migrate in birds. Uh, for the Zika virus, uh, have been uh, reported uh, as early as 1970 in, in the country. However, uh, during that viral uh, national uh, um, risk assessment for viral activity in response to, to the yellow fever outbreak in 2012, High prevalence of uh, Zika was reported, and this uh, uh, report was mostly in the eastern and central states of, of the country. However, the disease is uh, is neglected, and uh, in both uh, research and healthcare uh, service uh, for for the diagnosis. And this this might. Uh, might be masked by, by the other uh, disease and um, the poor uh, conditions and, and uh, poor uh, socioeconomic status of most of the populations where people uh, only present uh, to healthcare facility when they are severely ill. And as known Zika, uh, only one fifth of, of, um, of the infected people uh, show symptoms. So. I, I believe that uh, the actual deliverance might be way higher than uh, what could have known. And this lack of, um, uh, this, uh, lack of research and uh, surveillance or survey for Zika virus in the country leaves the country uh, policymaker and health care providers with very, very limited information about the disease in the country. Regarding uh, the chikungunya virus, um, uh, the uh, virus is in, endemic in, in the country and most of the state, two thirds of the state are, are endemic with, with chikungunya. Uh, however, it has been reported uh, way back uh, for the first time in 1970s. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, the country has uh, suffered greatly from a, a massive outbreak of chikungunya, mainly in the coastal and subcoastal state, uh, Red Sea and Kessela, where more than 47,000 cases have been reported um, uh, in that time. And uh, also, uh, Chikungunya represent a huge alarming uh, or a, a very uh, a serious alarm about shift in disease burdens because uh, Chikungunya cases in this state has, uh, although this state are endemic with malaria, but nevertheless during uh, 2018 and 19, Chikungunya cases have way exceeded uh, cases of malaria in the same state during the same time. So this might indicate a shift in disease, or whether uh, in response to climatic change or change in microenvironment that uh, uh, can be referring uh, more uh, either Sigitai than uh, the Anopheles arabensis or Anopheles gambia, the main vector in, in, uh, of malaria in the country. Um, also, it's important to highlight that Sudan uh, has high population dynamic and uh, due to several humanitarian and conflicts uh, in the country. This might have uh, contributed in, in the recent uh, dynamic of the disease and emergence and uh, a unique uh, outbreak uh, for, for some of them. And this leads us to the Rift Valley Fever, uh, which adds directly to the same point I was mentioned about a unique outbreak. 
uh, although the disease is endemic in the country since 1930s, uh, however, uh, the disease uh, is um, transmissions, uh, season of transmissions and case presentation is, is changing. The disease uh, is uh, Rift Valley fever has a very devastating impact on the country, not only uh, health wise, but, but also economic or uh, economic or uh, financial wise, because the country rely heavily on uh, animal uh, exportation and uh, people also rely on animal products and uh, animals and uh, Rift Valley fever has high rate of abortions and mortality among uh, domestic animals, particularly in the juveniles. Ayman, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to speed up a little bit, please. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So, uh, no worries. Um, and that's affecting more than 55% uh, of the country populations. So, this, you know, uh, recently, study that like I mentioned earlier, uh, showing uh, some changes uh, in, in the disease transmissions and case presentations uh, from severe to more wild, mild uh, presentations, make it less detectable. Um, I'm off uh, for, for the second part of, of my presentation, challenging and surveillance response. I, I divided in just challenges and a suggestion for improvement. So for the challenges, uh, it's, it's well known as my previous uh, colleague have thankfully mentioned, lack of funds is a major challenge uh, of, uh, impacting all aspects of health care. Uh, however, in case of Sudan, it's partnership and collaboration. It, there is a huge room for partnership and collaboration with local and international organizations to fill this gap, uh, particularly with, with high, uh, rapidly growing uh, uh, risk of arboviral disease in, in the country, and also integration with other disease programs like uh, the funded one uh, more, with, with more fund like malaria. Uh, another challenge is the overlap of disease symptoms uh, make uh, the you commonly uh, implemented clinical uh, diagnosis very challenging and, and particularly in lack of update information about uh, the presence of other disease in, in the area. So uh, clinicians are need to be trained on and refining the case definition and training the care providers about the new, this, uh, new uh, refining uh, case definition. Also improvement for the diagnosis capacity which is a major challenge because uh, most of the country rely on microscopic and clinical uh, diagnosis uh, due to the centralization of health services. So BCR uh, and multiple tools are very, very limitedly used in, in the central uh, city like Khartoum and only large hospitals, uh, which is way expensive for the public uh, people. Uh, to seek these services. So decentralization of health services and um, uh, support for molecular tools for diagnosis, it's, it's an urgent, urgently needed and crucially uh, for improving the diagnosis capacities in, in the country. Uh, delaying information change, uh, it's the last uh, challenge but not the least because uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the lack of uh, life information for the healthcare providers, it's uh, limiting the capacity for doing the uh, differential diagnosis and uh, requiring or recommending the specific uh, diagnostic tools uh, relevant to this. Uh, also, it's limiting the capacity of public health worker to provide the um, inter proper intervention timely and also limiting the capacity of policy health maker to, to make the right decisions. So improving the coordination between the different directorate within Minister of Health and multi-sectorial uh, coordination with other, with other uh, authorities, including Minister of Animal Resources, is, uh, is very, very important to, to improve uh, the information and improving uh, the surveillance and response to our viral disease. Here's some references uh, for further reading and thank you. Over. Okay, uh, Ayman, thank you sincerely for, for that presentation. Uh, excellent uh, insights there again. So I need to apologize to our audience for uh, perhaps being a little bit uh, le lenient with the uh, times of the presentations, but I think you'll agree with me, they were absolutely wonderful presentations. 
and I didn't want to unnecessarily, uh, you know, cut short uh, the, the the flow of the presentations. So uh, it took a little bit longer than anticipated, but I, I, I hope you agree with me. It was actually well worth it. So to our presenters, thank you so much. We're going to move on to questions and answers now. Uh, we come to the Q&A session. I need to repeat that we will end off the Q&A session with a summary review of the key points and impressions of the webinar. Prudence, if you could try and keep that very brief, if possible, I'd be grateful, but it's, it's going to be well worth listening uh, to your summary. Uh, please don't forget that there is a short poll right at the very end. Please wait uh, for that poll and respond if you don't mind. Please audience, uh, we'd be grateful for your, for your help there. So, um, I, because of the interest of, uh, because of uh, time is uh, uh, having run out, I'm going to limit it to one question that I'm going to pose to each of our panelists. Um, so there's been this flurry, wonderful flurry of activity in the Q&A and, and chat box uh, where, panel, where uh, the audience has posed questions to particular people and those particular people have responded and already answered uh, the questions uh, but if I, if I see correctly, that question then disappears. Uh, and my worry is that some of them are excellent questions that uh, would have been useful uh, for the panelists to have raised vocally uh, uh, in, during the Q&A session so that the entire audience uh, would have benefited from the response. So I'm going to try and pick up from memory uh, in my male compromise uh, single tasking mode. Uh, some of the questions I came across. So there was a comment, uh, and I'm going to address this uh, to Dr. Becerra, so so you can think about it so long. It's about community engagement. Uh, there was a comment there about uh, communities, and quite rightly so, because it's uh, 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 it's what communities do that impact and influence the scale of uh, mosquito breeding and so on. It's, it's what people do that uh, increases or reduces breeding, uh, Aedes breeding sites. And it's also the way people behave that increases or reduces their risk of exposure to Aedes mosquitoes as any vector of any mosquito-borne disease but it's, it's uh, uh, very relevant uh, in, in dengue and other mosquito uh, aedes born uh, diseases. So Dr. Bezerra, I want to ask you, uh, because this seems to be a common thread for malaria, for uh, arbovir mosquito borne arboviruses, uh, that community engagement practices are not optimally, they're not fully practice to the extent that they should, uh, that we can really improve on community engagement. Now, uh, I know there are guidelines provided by WHO, excellent guidelines, COMBI uh, guidelines, etc. And I'm not going to ask you to explain them, uh, and I'm not going to ask you to tell us what we should be doing. I'm going to ask you if you can just point shortly uh, because I think South America has some very good examples, kind of best practice examples. Can you point us towards perhaps one or two publications or examples where community engagement processes have been well implemented and can serve as, as best practice examples that the rest of us in Southeast Asia and in Africa and so on can learn from? Any, any pointers from you there, if you don't mind? Uh, thank you, Leo. I think that in the short time for say this, and uh, we need to establish a good communication with the community. I think this is the, the way to, to improve the engagement of this and the community and giving them um, a very, very, very indication what is the what they have to do to try to, to, to protect the housing for vectors. 
if you you presented you some uh, good example have one in, in Merida, in Mexico, when the community was receiving the the devising to protect the windows with its twins and the protect on the the the, the containers, put his screens in the container. And the, this was very, very, very successful uh, activity that I, I remember now. And the, this is right in some paper that I, from some colleagues from, from Colombia. The another the important engagement that I see recent was in Niterói in Brazil, when they promote, them, for example, the use of Vobacca there. Because our community, when we go to the house and they ask, what is this? What is this new method? Everyone say to you, this is a new method of how we use it, how is the benefit that we, we receive in, in this. And they, they understand that that is not a, 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 proof, a, a silver bullet to resolve the problem. And they say that they needed to continue to eliminate in bread site and protect your home. I think this is a bear and an activity that I came to say to you, the user, and they try to make the communities to engage in, in these activities. Over to you. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Harold. Uh, so I, I just have the impression there are lots of good examples going on uh, in South America, as indeed in, in, in Southeast Asia and elsewhere in the world. Uh, but it just kind of struck me that there's some good work going on in South America. So uh, <clears throat> my next question I'm going to address to you, uh, Dr. Nagpal. Uh, one of the questions uh, raised, the one of the audience members raised the question about hospitals being overwhelmed uh, during outbreaks. Uh, you know, <clears throat> countries report uh, their case numbers for what it's worth, because, uh, you know, uh, this is a whole separate webinar in itself about what do case numbers being reported actually mean? Because uh, in many cases, uh, it's just inpatient numbers that get reported. Outpatients get uh, given a bit of treatment and, and uh, told to go back home, uh, and, and they don't get captured in the reporting system. System that's never mind the asymptomatic cases that you don't even have a clue about. But at least there's some trend that you can get from the case numbers being reported, and that is captured by WHO and it's uh, reflected. What about uh, country capacity for medical treatment and hospitals being overloaded? Is there some way that WHO is capturing how countries cope with, for example, dengue outbreaks and so on? Uh, any, any thoughts about that, uh, Dr. Nagpal? Uh, so, that, so that one has an understanding of how countries are actually coping with outbreaks in terms of uh, treating people. Over to you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Uh, in during the no doubt during the outbreak number of cases increase and uh, hospital become full but uh, who directly doesn't play any role in that because this is a totally state subject of the disease monitoring and their control is totally based on that but who only give the guidelines and we don't directly involve in that key how to capture the number of cases and overburden of the disease and, and like that but only we put the guidelines with this type of the things that should be there, but uh, not like directly not WHO involved in such type of thing. Dr. Raman may also be clear this thing, but uh, I'm sure that w we are not doing any, any activity for the hospital to you that we are monitoring the number of cases and like that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lutomir, a uh, question to you, uh, also a question that was posed by the audience <clears throat> and then it disappeared off screen. And, and one that I found fascinating was uh, this issue of cross resistance. And if I remember correctly, the question was directed at you. This is why I'm throwing it back at you. But I understand if, uh, you know, if you feel you'd rather have someone else attempt an answer, no problem. The question was, uh, uh, 
people and cross resistance between having picked up one arbovirus infection and how does it provide protection against other arbovirus infections. So if you do, you know, a, a, a sero surveillance within the population, are you picking up multiple uh, disease infections uh, as reflected in serology in one person or are the infections discrete amongst different people across the population? Uh, do you do you have any do you have any idea about that? Uh, or, or yeah, let me ask it to you, Dr. Lutomir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leo. Sorry. Yeah, with regard to the above, um, serological surveillance, uh, it's possible to get a different uh, arboviruses uh, in different patients, indicating co-circulation of uh, these arboviruses within that particular area, but within different patients. It's rare that you'll find two um, arboviruses circulating within the same patient but this has been uh, observed before. However, the issue of uh, preventing or protecting an infected person against infection by another virus, that is something that uh, hardly probably occurs. Uh, even within, uh, let's say, the flaviridae uh, family. So you find that uh, we have uh, several uh, viruses, including yellow fever, uh, dengue, and uh, um, chikungunya and so on and so forth. Sorry, uh, um, dengue, Zika, and uh, yellow fever. So in this case, infection by one virus does not necessarily uh, prefer protection against infection by another different virus. So you'll find that if we have same or several viruses co-circulating in that particular environment, then they will be able to infect different people or even same people uh, at that particular time. Uh, so, even within the dengue itself, we have different serotypes, and uh, one serotype does not confer uh, immunity against a second serotype. So, that is really a rare occurrence within uh, the human population. Okay, <clears throat> excellent. Thank you for that short and sweet response. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Ayman, so this is also a, a common observation within the vector control uh, community that, uh, and within vector-borne disease control agencies, et cetera, that entomological capacity is a critical shortfall uh, across the globe. There's a shortfall in medical entomologists. There's a shortfall in vector surveillance skills. So can I ask you, what's hey, the man. situation? I'm in, uh, in, so, in, so, so sorry, we're running so slow. Hello? And hi, Lauren. Uh, congratulations, and welcome. To this. I'm I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't hear that response. But it sounds like Ayman, you may have a problem. So let me move then to uh, Dr. Rahman. Um, there was a comment about uh, 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 IRS. So. On the one hand, some people have the feeling that space spraying, these foggers, is very wasteful, uh, but countries persist in doing so for different reasons. So the best one can do is to try and help them to do it optimally. Uh, but there's a question that was raised about, does WHO recommend indoor residual spraying uh, for specifically for, for Aedes control? Uh, perhaps a thought from you there, uh, Dr. Rahman? Thank you, Leo. It's a very good pertinent question. Actually, this uh, whole concept comes from the fact that in the 60s and 70s, AIDS was eliminated from Latin America and uh, due to the fear of yellow fever. So there was a huge success during that period by uh, perifocal spraying, we call it. So right now, what we are, the evidence base uh, is, though it is not very comprehensive, uh, we feel, and there is more studies done in Australia, Mexico, and so on, which shows that IRS does have it, um, some level of impact. 
but it is not IRS, it's targeted indoor spraying because we target areas where uh, Aedes uh, rests and um, just after egg laying or before egg laying in and around the house and uh, the spraying is done approximately one and a half meters from the ground, uh, not the whole area. And it is done both inside and outside the house on our targeted areas. In Mexico, uh, they have been doing studies where this operation is done not only at the place of residence, but also at the place of work. And it seems to show quite good evidence of uh, reduction in cases. But we really need a very good randomized study uh, to do that. And actually the study was almost uh, about to take off last year, but it's currently on hold due to the COVID situation. But I think an ev a stronger evidence base will strengthen our case. But right now we say it has moderate evidence, yes. As far as uh, fogging is concerned, I fully agree with you. Uh, we don't have evidence, very strong evidences about fogging. And the only evidence we have, uh, a limited evidence, is indoor fogging having, having a, a limited impact. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rahman. Excellent response there. So uh, the time has come to give a wrap-up overview of the webinar, and I'd like to welcome and thank uh, Dr. Prudence Hamade, who is a pediatrician uh, with decades of experience working among rural communities in the greater Mekong sub-region sub and in Africa. Uh, you raise the issue of community participation with Prudence at your own peril. But <laughs> I say that tongue-in-cheek, uh, Prudence. I love listening to your experience about community community participation. Prudence is employed by Malaria Consortium as a senior, uh, a senior technical advisor uh, with a particular interest in malaria, pneumonia, mother and child diseases, and a strong voice for greater attention to the rising threat of arboviral diseases. Uh, Prudence will give us a, a wrap-up summary of the webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Prudence. Thank you very much, Leo, and thank you very much to all of these present presentations, which were extremely interesting and informative. Um, just to give a personal aspect, uh, I caught dengue myself when I was in Cambodia. I also worked in, uh, in hospitals in Cambodia, which were completely full of three children to a bed when, when, uh, when the dengue outbreaks were occurring. So I, I, I have a strong knowledge of a dengue. And um, my son, who is also a doctor, worked in India for a while uh, dealing with chikungunya. So we know uh, uh, intimately in the family about these diseases. Um, as a sum, it's very difficult to summarize completely all of these um, organize, all, all of these um, presentations. But I would like to say that we know that 130 countries are actually affected now by, by these arborvirus diseases and the burden is increasing very rapidly across all the countries. And in 2019, there were 5 million cases of dengue, for example. Um, the first challenge that was brought up by almost all the presentations was around the difficulty of estimating the burden of these diseases and that surveillance systems are not really geared to, to cope with, uh, with, with being able to say exactly what the disease burden is. And uh, WHO has come up with a good tool, the burden estimation tool, which I think um, should be utilized in all countries to try to estimate the burden, because we know that about 60 plus cases are actually due to asymptomatic disease but obviously that uh, increases the risk of transmission. So we really need to have this burden estimation tool. Um, the WHO also has a, a strategy um, which focuses on different pillars, which are intersectoral collaboration, which, which all the countries talked about, that we need to have better collaboration across the different departments within ministries of health, but also within the civil authorities, because a lot of the burden of diseases are actually um, in urban areas, although we see more and more occurring in rural areas, particularly with dengue. We also, as Leo has pointed out, we need to really get communities engaged because if we don't get communities engaged, they won't be able to help in the control of their vectors. 
uh, again, surveillance is a key part of actually understanding what the burden of disease is so we can use that both for advocacy to increase the funding for these diseases and, and also to be able to focus our attention on interventions. We also need appropriate tools to deal with those, um, with, with the vectors and with also particularly, it came out in many of the presentations that actually the diagnosis of these diseases is actually quite difficult at the clinical level because the symptoms of the diseases are very much the same and therefore the differential diagnosis is, is very difficult and that makes surveillance also extremely difficult if we don't know which disease we're dealing with. Um, there are many people, particularly Imperial College and Malaria Consortium is working with Imperial College to look at multiplex diagnostic tools which will be able to distinguish A, between bacterial and viral diseases, but also to be able to say which virus is causing what disease. So hopefully those tools can be defined and we can have better diagnosis, which will lead to better surveillance. The other big challenges that we have, and it's come out in all of the presentations, is, is, the, lack of, is the lack of funding. Um, and that lack of funding is due to the fact that that these are seen as neglected diseases and funding for neglected disease, tropical diseases is, is, is poor at the moment. And some of the problems are around the way the, the Global Fund is, is working only on malaria, doesn't want to look at these other vector-borne diseases. And we really need to increase the advocacy around uh, getting more funding, both for control, but also for research. It, it was very interesting to hear from Africa how they are looking at that most of these diseases originated in Africa and that, that there are at least 500 other viruses that are lurking in the background which may go on to become epidemic and we're not prepared for that and I think COVID has really shown us that we're not prepared to deal with uh, epidemics coming from viruses that we weren't expecting to come and I think that basic research is looking at these viruses and identifying them and making sure that they don't uh, become epidemic is really important. Um, the other thing that came out is the lack of entomologists and the career pathways for entomologists. And it was pointed out that in Africa, 97% of entomologists are uh, involved in malaria and that, that that, that is a really disproportion considering that malaria is, is, is becoming, is going down, thank goodness. But these other diseases are becoming more and more important. One of the reasons it seems to me is that the actual mortality from these diseases, except perhaps for yellow fever, uh, is, is quite low and therefore people are, have not been looking at it. But the actual long-term effects on the economy, as was pointed out by the from Sudan, that the effects on the health and economy of the population is really serious and we need to make sure that, that the international funding bodies understand that. Um, the, the, uh, again, we, we, I, th I think those are the main things that we, we have to look at. The other issues that are going to affect us in the, in the future, as everyone pointed out, is climate change because uh, the climate is going to mean that the mosquito vectors are going to spread further. We also know that the increase of urbanization, poverty, uh, lack of water, particularly as was pointed out by, by, the, uh, by Dr. Rapinda, is going to become a very serious problem. So storage of water will, will take place and that will mean that these, these particular vectors will multiply even more. So I think that's really as the, uh, much of a summary as I can actually make, Leo. So hopefully um, we can pay attention to those particular challenges around, uh, around arbovirus borne diseases. We need to be prepared for new epidemics. We need to have more 
training of epidemiologists. We need to train clinicians in better diagnosis and, and management of these diseases to prevent mortality. But we also need to realize how these diseases not only affect mortality, but the actual morbidity associated with them, as we see with COVID, with long COVID. We know that dengue often takes a long time for people to recover. It also, in, in many epidemic endemic countries, affects children's health, their education, etc. So it's not only mortality that's important, and we really need to raise those issues for, for the point of view of advocacy. So over Prudence, to you. Uh, Prudence, uh, thank you for those incisive and very perceptive perceptive observations. Uh, wonderful summary, very grateful for that, kind of ties everything together. Wonderful uh, overview. So uh, before the audience completely drops off, I'd like to ask, please, Tin, could you put up the, uh, the poll now? And, and I humbly ask our audience members to please, if you wouldn't mind just responding uh, to those uh, four questions as best you can. Uh, don't spend forever uh, thinking about it. Uh, we'll leave it up there for about five minutes. And at the end, you can just hit the submit button at the bottom and submit it. I promise you it's of great help to, to us in trying to understand where people think the priorities and shortfalls lie and, and, and as to how we should move forward in trying to support and help vector-borne disease control programs. So my little humble perspective, it's been an absolutely wonderful webinar. It's met my very highest expectations, and that is absolutely due to the quality and the input from our panelists. So please, panelists, uh, to each of you, a genuine, sincere, uh, expression of gratitude for a job well done. Uh, I think you've uh, inspired a lot of people in the audience. Uh, you've uplifted our level of understanding. Uh, and for that, we are very grateful. Really a job well done. So to everyone, including our audience and especially our audience members, I looked at the questions popping up, my goodness, just left and right, and here they come. Uh, and and uh, good questions too. And then hats off to the, to the panelists who kept dealing with uh, many of the questions as they popped up, just responded to them and they disappear as having been dealt with. So to everyone concerned, including Tin, and our uh, uh, support staff in, in London, Malaria Consortium, sincere thank you. Tin, uh, you've done a lot of work in the background and I acknowledge that and we're grateful for that. To everyone concerned, thank you so much and have a wonderful day forward. If you can, please help with the uh, poll. Thank you so much. Bye-bye everyone.